Hey, welcome back. Last week we looked at programming a very simple pendulum. This week we'll take it a step further and we'll see if we can build a Newton's cradle out of it. So to last week's code, I just want to make a very simple correction. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, with that being out of the way, we'll try to build a Newton's cradle. Uh, so a lot of resources on the internet on how to build a, um, uh, a Newton's cradle only talk about simulating a, a Newton's cradle, but are not true to the physics of it. It's either that or number two, um, it uses one of those JavaScript third party physics libraries, um, uh, a sort of physics engines um, that will basically create the Newton's cradle for you. Uh, these I feel Yes, I mean, of course you can do that. You could, you could use that. You could use physics engines to generate your Newton's cradle. Um, but that somehow skips over uh, understanding the physics of it. Uh, so, you know, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, build a Newton's cradle uh, and, uh, you know, at least understand the physics behind it. And uh, yeah, you know, you know, you know, once you understand the physics behind these things, uh, these Newton's cradles toys, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can go on and start using other libraries once you understand what's behind the physics uh, or, or, or the physics behind it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, before I start, I just wanted to um, make a small correction um, to the code that we made last week. Uh, so yeah, so first things first, let's look at the setup. Uh, just like last week, I have a canvas. I have an, uh, an index.html in JavaScript. I have, um, you know, I have a canvas of a specified width and height and everything. Uh, and I have the main JavaScript file. Um, you know, from this week onwards, I have decided or uh, to make sure that I use proper JavaScript um, variable naming conventions, not variable names as such, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that I use const wherever I mean to use a constant variable where I, wherever I mean to use a global variable and let and uh, yeah and the let um, um, you know instead of variable wherever I mean to use a, a, a local variable you know so that the JavaScript garbage uh, collector uh, is a little bit more efficient in in cleaning away um, variables that are no longer lead uh, that are no longer required to be sitting in memory all right that being said uh, what do I have uh, this week? All right. So, all right. so one thing that I changed from last week uh, was that I, I made it a little bit object oriented in that I have, I now have a class called Bob, which will basically represent the pendulum. And um, I have the same variables as last week. I mean, I have a pivot, a mass, um, I mean, I have radius. Uh, uh, the radius is basically calculated out of a mass. Um, so remember a pendulum a pendulum's motion or its period is not dependent on its mass, but it's actually dependent on its um, on its uh, on its length, its fulcrum length. However, when you are calculating angular momentum for which we for which you know which we would definitely need for this week, you would need a mass, which is why I have a mass variable here. Um, so so that's the change from last week with regards to pendulum, and then I I basically calculate the radius of the pendulum. Uh, as a proportion of the mass that is supplied. So the bigger the mass, the bigger the radius of the bob. All right. Um, another thing that I wanted to, uh, to convey over here is that last week we looked at this theta, the, the angle that's actually in radians and it's not in degrees. Um, so when it comes to radians, a full circle is two pi, half circle is pi and, uh, and everything like that. Uh, and then I have the location, fulcrum length, the, the, the angular velocity and, um, and I also have, and I also wanted to make sure that each bob has its own color uh, or each pendulum has its own color. So I basically pass the color, um, you know, uh, I basically pass the color as a parameter to the constructor. I have an update function that essentially updates the location of the, of the bob and the location is calculated out of the sine and the cos. Uh, you know, uh, uh, an equation that we looked at last week. I also have a render, which basically renders the pendulum. Um, and in the main JavaScript file, I initialize the canvas. I have, uh, yeah, and I create a new Bob over here and I um, give it an arbitrary color and, uh, you know, uh, the pivot point and everything. So I, once I do that, uh, I, now, I now call a draw cradle function, which basically does a draw cradle. Uh, and uh, it updates the bob and it renders the bob. So let's just look at what it looks like. 
So once I do that, this is what it looks like. Now this is for gravity nine point, um, this is for Earth's gravity. And I realized that for the purposes of this, you know, it, it does look a little bit fast. One way to actually slow it down is to give less and less gravity, right? I mean, this is of course a simulated environment. It doesn't have to be true to the physics of planet Earth and everything, right? So I'm just gonna make it three, which is again an arbitrary num number, which I thought would be a little bit more appropriate in, uh, in animating it. So you would be actually be, be able to see it animating properly. Uh, you could make it slower. So let's say for example, 0 0.1, I, I'm not sure which planet has a 0 0.1. Maybe it's on, a, on the surface of an asteroid. This is what the pendulum would look like. So yeah, so you could make it, you have the choice of making it slower. Anyways, I'm just going to leave it at three. Uh, yes, so 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 G is now the, the the gravitation, the acceleration of gravity is now a constant called capital G. I also have um, a variable called damping. You know, uh, we did look at damping last week. So every time we calculate the angular velocity, you know, uh, we say velocity. Uh, we we dampen it a little bit every time the uh, the pendulum moves. All right. Uh, another thing that I did was I declared a constant called two pi. And the reason for that is every time uh, this bob is being drawn, we say uh, we usually give math dot pi into two. That's because an arc, I mean, uh, uh, an arc is measured in radians, and two pi is basically a full circle, which is why we need to calculate it. So I thought it would be a little bit easier if we just pre-calculate this two pi and keep it as a constant. So that's what I have done. Maybe I should move two pi um, uh, into the code space API. You know, that would be a, like a better place. Um, um, so yes, so so we could do that because we do use a lot of um, arc and uh, we do draw a lot of arcs and everything on the screen. So we'll do that at a later point in time. We'll just leave it over here. All right. So what does a Newton's cradle look like? Let's just very quick quickly look at it. Uh, I'm just going to open Wikipedia just so that we know what a Newton's Newton's cradle looks like. All right. So that's what a Newton's cradle looks like. Uh, now the great thing about about Newton's cradle is um, is you know if I was to pull on two of these bobs from the Newton's cradle and if I leave it, it would basically release two other on a, uh, two on the other side. So basically, whatever force you apply over here is divided among uh, uh, amongst the um, the pendulums on the other end. We will see this simulated, um, of course. So so this is what we are essentially trying to to simulate. All right, a Newton's cradle. And what does it look like? So it looks like we have a bunch of pendulums, um, you know, hanging by several pivot points. So, so they are all basically split into several pivot points. So let's do that. All right. So we already have a Bob class and it's not, um, uh, and it's not inconceivable that we can draw many Bobs, right? So for example, if I was to do something like this, um, no, that wouldn't work because I cannot use the same variable. So I'm now going to create a variable. Uh, so instead of this one variable, I'm going to call this variable as pendulums. Or let's because we have many pendulums. And here goes another constant. And I can say um, num underscore pendulums. So this basically defines how many pendulums we want to draw, right? So I'll just start with two so that we can see two pendulums. All right, so now I have the pendulums. And I can now say for where i is equal to zero, i less than num pendulums, i plus plus. Oh, hold on. Uh, yeah, so pendulums, I can just basically declare it as an array of num pendulums, of size num pendulums. So now that I have that, um, I can now say pendulums of i is equal to new bob of this point needs to be like a single point all right so what is this this is essentially a pivot point right so i can declare this as a common variable pivot point is equal to new point uh, point being a class that we have declared in the code space api so i can have this as the pivot point uh, i'm going to have a constant mass over here so which is 10 and um, uh, what is that? So I'm going to call it mass. I'm just going to declare a variable here. Uh, and like I promised, I'm going to use proper variable naming, uh, not uh, variable declaration techniques uh, by using the let for uh, uh, 
yeah for uh, by using the let for for all variables that are declared within the scope of functions i mean basically i don't want this mask to exist outside of the init uh, so that the garbage collection knows that it's ready for picking up and everything all right that being said i also need a color and i want to make sure that the color is essentially constant among all of the um is constant every i don't i don't want to generate a random color is what i'm trying to say i want it to remain constant very fortunately we have this hue to um uh, this hsb to rgb color um that we could use so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to declare a variable called hue remember hue is a variable is is a value from 0 to 1 all right so 0 being red and 1 being also being red but it's sorry but it cycles between all of the colors between 0 and uh, between red and and red you'll see so i'm going to say uh say 0 and i'm going to say increment hue we have done this before actually so increment hue is you know how many steps should i increment it by and so that i would say uh increment it by 1 by because 1 is the maximum by the number of pendulums All right, so I have this. Then I'm going to declare. Uh, I'm going to say where RGB. Um, yes, so RGB um, is equal to HSP, right? I mean, it's called uh, HSL to R uh, to. We could actually op just open the code space API. Um, yeah, so there it is. Yeah, there it is. So that's the HSL to RGB function that we are invoking. So HSL to RGB. All I have to give is hue as a number. I'm going to say one is the number. I mean, uh, one is the saturation and lightness is 0.5. We don't want to make it too bright because if you make it too bright, then it doesn't it doesn't do anything. So um, so this gives me an integer containing three values. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an integer array containing three. Now items, um, you know, and I can say this is R G P of R G B of one. So R G B of zero is red, one is green, and R G B of Two. So now I have these three colors. Um, close the bracket. So now I have that RGB color. Just set this RGB color over here. Um, yes, and then I do an update location. And then let me just increase the the hue over here. So I'll just increase the hue over here, and that should basically give me two pendulums. All right. So let's just go back. uh bob is not defined why is it not oh yeah of course because uh yeah a lot of things that we are missing over here so that's number one another thing that i need to do is to ensure that i do this so it should be dot render of the the newton's cradle context Let's see. All right. So now, now, so now we have two bobs. It's just that it's it's one behind the other because we have given the same pivot point and everything. We need to basically spread these um, newtons, um, uh, spread these pendulums so that they just about touch each other. So that we will ensure in just a bit. But before we even go there, we could just say um, pendulums of zero is equal to. I'm sorry. Dot. Theta is equal to minus one. All right, I'm just giving an arbitrary value of minus one. So you can see the two pendulums. So I wasn't lying. There are actually two pendulums. It's just that they were one behind the other. All right. That being said, I need to make sure that these pendulums are actually, uh, you know, they appear exactly as um, uh, as they would appear on a Newton's cradle. They are basically offset. to uh, to each other so for that uh, so remember so let's look at these variables over here so that's the pivot point so that's the so that's where the pivot point lies and we've declared it as like a single variable over here but that the, the pivot point changes for each and every pendulum is what i'm trying to say okay so that basically would it uh, would it uh, uh, would be its center all right so that's the uh, that's the theta that's the length all right 
what else so let's create this pivot point as a variable here this should be let let um, it's hard to let go of, um, of bad practices or, or it's hard to let go of old practices all right so now i uh, yeah what did i want to do i wanted to have the pivot point declared over here just to make sure that it still all works all right good 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 uh, so pivot point will basically start at width by two minus. Um, so so basically they all. So if I add, if I have two pendulums, both the pendulums have to be in the center. There is actually an easy way of doing it. So I can say. Uh, so let's look at what is the radius of every. Um, all right. So I already have the mass. All right. So even before I calculate the mass, I basically need to know the ra its intended radius. So I can do this. Uh, by <clears throat> by saying that each bob's radius would be i'll just take the i'll just take the code from from over here so that i know what is the radius of each uh, each bob all right so my intention is that all of these bobs would have the same length so i'll just do that so bob radius would be mass into the width of the canvas by 200 so that the radius is proportional and everything um all right so what would be start x so start x so why do, why do i need a start x all right so i'm just what i'm going to do is i'm going to replace this with start x and i'm going to increment the pivot point by uh, uh you know by the radius of the bob all right so so if the bob is of let's say 10 in radius so i'm going to increment it by 20 i mean because that's the diameter all right so i need to do that so start x would basically start at the at the bob radius that's where it would start so i have uh, yes and after i do that i'll just say start x plus is equal to pop radius right um, no i'll have to increment it by the uh, by the diameter so that would be bob radius into 2 all right uh, so one assumption that we are making over here is that all of the bombs would be of the same mass if they have different mass we'll have to basically change it so there you go so that so we did something um, let me just remove the theta over here just so that we can make sure that they're just almost touching each other just almost touching each other um so yes so so start x should not be actually um actually bob radius it should be width by two minus bob radius uh, or at least um not bob radius into num pendulum so how many ever pendulums we have um, you know we take uh, so how many ever pendulums we have we take that um, and then we reduce that value let's see if that works does that look like it's in the center i don't think so so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say bob radius into two because that's the diameter all right so now if i uh, so uh, uh, so if the bob diameter is 10 um, uh, is 10 so that's uh, so so all of the bobs combined would be a total of 20 pixels so i need to center them so that would be into two and overall i would i'll have to say minus two does that work no all right so that's still pop radius into the number of pendulums correct uh yeah so i'm I, so yeah i i think for our purposes this is good i'm just going to leave it like this and let's see what happens if i was to increase the number of pendulums by five because generally that's how many uh, that that's how many bobs you would have in the um, uh, in, a, in a newton's cradle i mean if you looked at the wikipedia page you'd see that that's how much they have and once i increment the number of pendulums you can also see that the uh, that the um, the, uh, that the colors begin to cycle i can also do things like you know let's say if i had 15 it would still be uh, it would still be like this all right so that's great uh, let's just start with two here for example so now i have this two um, you know but it still bothers me that they're not exactly in the center so i'm just going to take a moment over here um, i'm just going to take a moment over here 
so that's width by two so that's width by two that which is correct and so that's the bob radius uh, so yes so once again old habits die hard star text i have the star text and i have declared the star text over here which is and incremented by bob radius by the diameter which is basically correct this should i think be diameter uh, over here let's see oh, it goes back okay uh, i think it should be diameter by 2 okay that is still not in the center for some reason because do i have to do this that's the bob okay okay oh wait are you okay so that's width by 2 minus the number of pendulums and uh, the bob diam diameter uh, which is divided by 2 so oh yeah oh oh okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say star x plus is equal to bob radius all right so that sort of makes sense to me because it does yeah so this basically starts right in the middle so if i was to have let's say seven pendulums they should all still be in the center which means the gap over here and the gap so yeah so that somehow makes sense to me that i do that all right so let's just go back to two. Oh, and another thing that i wanted to wanted to do was you know these colors are a little bit too bright uh, so i'm going to decrease their saturation not from one just let's say 0 0.8 too bright all right i I, th I think this is fine another thing that i want to do was i want to just say plus two over here so that these bobs are just barely not touching each other this would be useful whenever you are calculating collisions oh yes calculating collisions that would actually be something that um, that i'll have to explain but that's fine all right so there you go so so now we have that right and i and i can go back to saying um pendulums of zero uh, dot oh come on theta is equal to minus one so that i start swinging from the left hand side so yeah so as you can see there's absolutely no collision or anything of that sort happening over here perfect <coughs> all right so what do we do so um so the update function of the bob essentially takes care of um you know updating the acceleration velocity um and its angular um, and uh, and the bob's angle and everything but because the collision has to because we need to basically check for collisions and everything um i think i'm going to keep the 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 crux of the newton's cradle within the newton's cradle or js itself instead of making the pendulums responsible for basically doing the collision check because if i had to do that i would have to pass the references of one bob to another bob so basically each bob would have to maintain references to two of its neighbors and i think as an uh, it beca it's a little bit too complicated so i'll just keep it in the newton's cradle main javascript file itself so that in this case it just becomes like um uh, you know uh, it just becomes like a very simple collision a, a, a very simple index check for me all right and with those indexes i can like basically start checking for collision perfect all right so what do i need i need to basically check for collisions how do i do that so let's create a function called um so yes so let's create a function called basically we'll have to start checking for collisions okay so how do i do that all right so we could do this so i am going to create a variable uh, this is also let so let uh next i so basically this is the next index or let's so, so let's say this is one pendulum and then it needs to go to the next so i'll say next i is equal to um yeah I, I, oh or um so so basically i need a reference to the next pendulum okay um so i will say if i 
is greater than if it is greater than zero right i mean basically this is the next pendulum so the next pendulum would be um pendulums of i plus one um so yeah so if i is greater than zero no uh, no i'm sorry so if i have to get the next pendulum i'll have to make sure that this pendulum is not the last all right so i is less than num pendulums minus one then the next pendulum would be um, pendulums of i plus one so that's the next pendulum all right and i can say check collision between the current pendulum and the next pendulum all right so that i mean uh, i i could i could do that right so i'm going to call this function check collision which will accept two parameters bob1 and bob2 all right so these are basically variables of the class bob so now i have two bobs okay now how do you check for collisions between two circles it's actually very easy to do uh, let me just open up pinta hmm okay so uh, so how do you check collisions between two circles um it's actually quite easy to do we are not checking the collisions for very complex polygon polygons like uh like a pentagram uh, or a hexagon uh, or or a pentagon i'm sorry i did, I, I said pentagram not the right word it's uh, it's hexagon you know not not complex polygons all right so they just circles and they are actually very easy to calculate their their distances between because what happens is that all i need to do is calculate the distances between their centers and if the distances between their centers let me just pick up um, what is this that's the pain so if the distances between their um between their centers is less than the radius uh, than the combined radius of the circles then i know that they have collided that's all i need to do all i need to do is calculate the distances between the centers of these circles that's all all right so in the check collision i'm going to say i'm going to create a variable called distance and i'm going to use our inbuilt function called get distance um remember this is in the code space dot api and all it does is just say i'm sorry this has to be uh you know all it does is basically just calculate the hypotenuse so now i have pop1 dot location dot y and pop pop2 dot location dot x and bob2 dot location dot y all right so that's it i have the distances if distance is less than if the distance is less than pop1 dot radius plus pop2 dot radius i know that a collision has happened for now i am just going to say console dot log collide that's it all right that's a spelling mistake but that's that's fine all right so let's review just for a moment over here so i have this number of pendulums so if the next pendulum yeah uh, i mean if i is still not at the very end of the uh, of the length of the pendulums then get me the next pendulum and check collision between this pendulum and the next pendulum if there are no more pendulums on the right hand side of this pendulum this would not even be evaluated i should be right let's see all right uncord bob is not uh, uh, newton's cradle at line 73 uh, so it's bob 2 i'm sorry that's bob 2 just want to make sure that i have okay all right so let's see once again so there you go so that's so every time it collides over there you will see that this uh, you know uh, it basically prints out this value over here i'm going to slow down the gravity not slow down i'm going to make sure that gravity is very less so that you can actually see that there is a correlation between um you know so so yeah so there you go so that's basically how you evaluate collision between two circles it's pretty simple to do i'm going to set this back at 3 so that it's it's proper and everything all right so now that we know that it collides what do we do uh, and before we even do over there uh, go there we also have to check for collisions on the left hand side so if i is greater than 0 then 
previous pendulum if i is greater than 0 then get me the previous pendulum which is at i minus 1 and check collision between this current pendulum and the previous pendulum this is for when you have collision on the other end you want to make sure that it hits it on the uh, on this end um, as well so uh, so yes so so basically this should work let's see um, yeah uh, all right so i i think i uh, yeah i'm just going to put Just say going to ch going to say check over here. I'm just going to make sure that it hits it on both the ends um, over here. So so yeah. So so I, I I think it is basically checking at at both ends. So we are good. And now we come to the crux of the matter. How do we basically convert the angular mo uh, the angular velocity of? So we'll have to basically do two things. Number one we will have to convert the angular velocity of this pendulum into a um, uh, uh, the angular velocity of the pendulum into a linear velocity or a tangential velocity once you have that velocity we will have to convert it into um, uh, we will have to basically convert we will have to calculate the the momentum of that pendulum all right when it comes to momentum remember i think momentum uh, uh, momentum is mass into the velocity so uh, so it's mass into the velocity it's mv all right so once we calculate the, the momentum we'll also have to calculate for the uh, the conservation of uh, of momentum so once we have conservation of momentum we can then calculate the velocities or the tangential velocities after so uh, before and after the collision so there is some energy transference that happens uh, so we'll have to calculate velocities before and after collision and once we have the uh, uh, the final velocities we'll have to convert it back into angular velocities and then assign it back uh, to the pendulum so that's what we have um, that's what we need to do so let's just look at um, a paper that i was referencing when i was basically trying to do this newton's cradle all right so i'm going to link this paper in the description uh, in the description and uh, it's i think it's just a two or three page paper that basically uh, uh, you know explains how to basically do this angular uh, conservation of angular momentum and conservation of kinetic energy and it gives this very neat uh, very beautiful uh, equations that i can just basically plug in into my uh, into my program all right into our program all right so let's just look at this uh, uh, these lines that are very important uh, are the most relevant lines of this document all right now it is easy to write the conservation of momentum and kinetic energy as two equations conservation of momentum is equal to when, yeah which is mass into velocity of the first object into mass plus mass uh, into velocity of the second object is equal to the mass and the velocity um, you know after the collision so uh, the v1 and v1 prime over here the one with the accent uh, is called as prime so that's basically the velocity after uh, uh, you know that's basically the velocity after the collision all right so conservation of momentum essentially states that uh, the momentum before and after the collisions are the same the same goes for kinetic energy the kinetic energy before and after will also be the same all right so over here they state that combining these two equations and doing a lot of algebra gives the final velocities of objects one and two so it says it doing a lot of algebra i tried to do the algebra but um, but unfortunately it's not one of my strongest suites but i'm going to trust the equations that are specified over here and uh, just going to plug this into our uh, uh, into our um, into our program and see what comes out all right so v1 prime prime meaning the velocity after the collision is equal to you know it's equal to this v2 prime is equal to this equation all right but before we even get over here remember all of our velocity all of our angular momentum it's everything is on uh, all of our velocity and momentum are angular momentum and angular velocity we'll have to convert them into tangential or linear velocity or linear momentum let's see how to do that so i'm just looking at the wikipedia article of the angular velocity and i think the most important um, line over here would be um, where is that I, 
yeah f would basically be this so from the above equation we can recover the tangential velocity as tangential velocity is equal to the um, uh, is equal to the angular velocity into the radius of the pendulum all right so uh, so that's all we need to do so first things first all right now uh, so yeah so so now that these two bobs have collided what do i need to do so i'm going to say let m1 i mean we basically so remember when we cal when we start to calculate momentum we would require the mass of the bob and everything uh, over here so i'm going to say m1 is equal to bob1 dot mass let m2 is equal to bob2 dot mass okay i'm going to uh, i'm going to name these variables in exactly the same way as this paper specifies so it's all v1 m1 and uh, and everything i know we could just basically use these and plug them in into, uh, into equations but i think it will be easier to read if i was to like uh, you know name these things um, appropriately so v1 what would v1 be so remember over here we need the tangential velocity So we need the linear velocity or the tangential velocity. So, so V1 would be what? Uh, would be exactly over uh, over this. So, so V1 is equal to um, the the angular velocity into the radius or the fulcrum length. So that would be Bob uh, Bob one dot velocity into Bob one dot fulcrum length all right so yeah so that's about it actually so v2 would be bob2 dot velocity the bob2 dot fulcrum length all right so i have so i have so i now have the linear velocity um all right so now we so so now we have the mass so we have m1 v1 and m2 v2 all we need is the new v1 and uh, the v1 prime and the v2 prime or or the velocities after the collision all right I'm going to say v1 prime is equal to just going to plug in this equation v1 prime is equal to v1 into m1 minus m2 v1 into m1 minus m2 plus 2 into m2 into v2 which is correct yeah which i think is correct all right all right v into m1 minus m2 plus 2 into all right divided by m1 plus m2 m1 plus m2 so that's your v1 prime so we already have <coughs> the velocity of the second bob after the collision has happened is that it really yeah uh, yeah i think so so let's just do v2 prime now what does v2 prime say it's v2 into m2 minus m1 it's v2 into m2 minus m1 which is correct plus 2 into m1 v1 by m1 plus m2 that's it yeah so now we have the linear velocities after collision on it so so we need the linear velocity before collision we have the linear velocities after collision all right so now what do i what do i need so all i need to do is basically convert this back into um so so what would that be so i just need to convert it back into uh, into angular velocity so that would just be this by bob1 dot hmm, come on fulcrum fulcrum length yeah because I, I think yeah i think that's it so i just need to reconvert it back v2 prime by bob2 dot fulcrum length yeah that's about it would that work 
so yeah so so now i have the collision and everything on it let's see how this look what this looks like so there you go so there are some things that are happening over here all right so so there is some collision so so co the collision is being detected there are some changes to the velocity but then something very weird happens over here and what i'm going to do to uh, to basically debug this is first of all i'm going to slow down the reaction so now i have set g back to an asteroid or something and what i'm going to do is <coughs> is measure the velocities before I, I mean basically just log the velocities before and after the collision all right all right okay to see yeah these are just some debug statements just making them a little bit pretty to read and everything let's see now all right so that's so there you go so that's the before and the after all right so what is that all right that was a little bit too fast for me to read but let's just go back right to the top over here so that's the before and that's the after so that's okay so that's before yes so you can see that before one of the pendulums was just zero and um, i mean the velocity was just zero and then it became five or whatever but after the first ones became five and the next one became zero over here but that's obviously not what's happening its velocity is still you know residing over there so we need to basically do some correction uh, over here and what sort of correction am i, am I talking about so remember that these collisions are essentially instantaneous so whenever uh, so so when this collision happens it will collide with uh, i mean uh, the the energy transference is basically instantaneous so the so the so the conservation of angular momentum is essentially instantaneously it gets transferred um, to ensure that that is properly simulated or it looks proper what i'm going to do is i'm going to say um so so yeah so i have this i'm going to say if is equal to 0 i'm going to say bob1 dot theta is also equal to 0 so so remember when we saw this you saw that the collision after i mean uh, the value after the collision is 0 if it is 0 i'm going to make sure that the uh, that the pendulum doesn't even need to move it doesn't need to basically uh, go anywhere so i'm going to set its theta and the reason why it was not being set as zero so if you can just see the simulation once again the reason why that never stopped was because remember this calculation keeps on happening over and over again so even after the velocities got transferred its theta never changed uh, or basically uh, you know uh, you know it just started calculating its new um, uh, its new theta value so i'm going to say that uh, if you have transferred all of your velocity to the other bob then make sure i mean which basically means that the velocity is zero just make sure that your theta is also zero so you do not move at all you know which is why the red pendulum over here continues to move why does it continue to move because remember even though it transferred all of its energy over here we never set its theta to zero so which is what i'm doing over here if the velocity is zero just make sure that the theta is also zero um yeah so so after the theta is zero i need to, i also need to make sure that i call the update location why do i need to call the update location because the theta is zero i need to make sure that it's basically centered right in the aim right in between right, so that it doesn't move anywhere so it's not just not enough that you all that you calculate that you set theta to zero you also have to make sure that you update the location over here oh also i need if it is not zero i need to make sure that i say theta plus is equal to bob one dot velocity yeah so 
yeah and uh, if it is not zero i just need it to continue working as it was previously so i'm just going to go ahead and add that velocity and then i'm going to update the location it's, it's the exact same thing that i'm going to do to bob2 as well so i now have if bob2's velocity is zero just make sure that it doesn't have any angle any uh, angle at all and just update its location after you increment the theta uh, also uh, so now let's see what this looks like. All right. Uh, yeah. So now you can see that there is an instantaneous transfer of uh, of momentum that happens over here. I'm just going to remove these logs. Um, what else do I need to do? Oh, yeah. So there you go. So that's two. I'm sorry. I think that was the issue. Um, I think that's one issue. Yes. Now let's see what happens. All right, and you will see that this actually looks exactly like uh, a Newton's cradle. Hey, hold on. Let me set the gra reset the gravity back to three, and now let's see what happens. All right, so that's a much better way of looking at. Yeah, so that's more like uh, uh, like a Newton's cradle. What will happen if I increase the number of pendulums to five? It should still work exactly as um, as it is supposed to. Right, I mean exactly like how um, a Newton's cradle is supposed to look like. All right, so yeah, so this is not like a perfect physics um, simulation, but it um, but it gives you a sense of how uh, the mathematics behind a Newton's cradle essentially works. You know, the conservation of angular momentum, cancel conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and everything works. All right, so that being said, one of the things about a Newton's cradle is that if I was to have two of these pendulums start from let's say like this it should it is supposed to push out two on the other end but that's obviously not what's happening all right let's slow down gravity over here for just a moment all right and does that seem to work? No. So, so there is something happening over here with the velocity calculation. All right. So that doesn't look true to the physics of it. I'm just going to restart it once again, and you will see that it basically crashed into the uh, into the uh, into the other end. So there's something weird going on over here, and that's probably got to do uh, something to do with the. Um, with this calculation uh, over here. All right, this calculation is not perfect because it essentially, uh, what do you say? I mean, it essentially assumes that it's a very uh, elastic collusion. Um, so there's something weird going on over here. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to say, just going to do that. Just see what is the velocity between these two. Oh yeah, so so what this is measuring is that there is some collision that's happening even before they they meet. Um, so yeah, so there's some collision that happens between these two, and you know even before they meet the uh, meet the uh, meet the set, uh, and that's what is basically causing it to to behave like that. So just to make sure that I am able to complete this week's episode, I'm just going to say if maths.abs v1 minus v2 is less than a threshold and i'm going to say that threshold is whatever this g is all right what's 3.05 minus um, yeah let's see all right i'm just going to open calculator and just see what that threshold is 3.05 minus 2.98 give me 0 0.07 just going to make sure that if the velocities are is less than the g variable then just continue do not calculate any linear velocities i mean do not calculate any uh, conservation of momentum don't do anything at all all right so what i'm trying to do over here is that if the Collision is below a specific, uh, or if the differences, if the 
differences between the velocities of the bobs is below a specific threshold uh, then don't even then don't calculate anything in this case what I'm doing is that I'm just setting G as a threshold all right so that the faster a bob moves uh, the more the threshold is or the more the gravity is the more the threshold is only if the threshold is above a certain limit only then you calculate the uh, the duration and everything all right uh, am i doing a console log anywhere no let's see if this works oh continue of course i'm going to say return not continue this isn't a loop all right let's see all right so now i think now i think we're good yeah i think that's true to the physics of it um, or at least it looks true to the physics of it let me just increase gravity here yeah oh so something did happen here all right so what what was that yeah i mean um, v1 minus v2 or should i say velocities bob one velocity and bob two velocity is less than um yeah let me see what happens if i give a Hmm, that still didn't look right to me. All right, I'm just going to leave it at G over here and not even return. I'm just going to make sure that all of these variables I'm setting are correct. It's two into M two minus V two. All right, let's do this. Let's squish these so that it's a little bit easier to read so that we know that these are definitely numerators and denominators. Uh, so this is definitely the numerator all right and this would definitely be the denominator I just wanted to make sure that I got that right so if the velocity is zero uh, then theta is zero then I mean yeah I mean if it is not zero then increase theta to its velocity uh, and then update the location. Uh, Bob two, it's the same. And let's see. All right, that still looks a little bit weird to me. Um, yeah. So that's V one. Okay, let's just go back and. Let me set this at two. See what happens. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So maybe I just have to make sure that start x of pop. Okay, so Bob did. Yeah, I have given two over here, which means there is like a slight gap. Um, if I don't do this and if I did this, all right. So I just wanted to make sure that they do have a gap here. So yes, yeah, so they do have a gap. We reset them back so start x plus is equal to uh, yeah so that i have given them like a specific gap and everything is setting this back to three all right so if bob 2's velocity is zero then set and um yes uh and then update location All right, you know what? I'm gonna take. Just gonna set this separately. And the reason is I want to set the velocities before I do anything at all. I'm gonna set the velocities. Hmm. What if I increase the threshold to let's say five or something? What happens then? Oh boy, you can see what happens here, um, you know. Am I making a mistake here? If i is greater than zero, then previous pendulum is i pendulums of i minus one, which is basically the previous pendulum, then pendulums of i, and then previous pendulum, which is correct, right? Um, 
yes so each pendulum must calculate uh, for each other yes okay you know what i'm going to do the update before <clears throat> before i do the the pendulums over here yeah before i check for the collision but well, it's a, so yeah so this basically seems to yeah that is still weird to me uh just going to say g here and let me just print out up so the two fixed on will only give me uh all right i'm going to set g as 0.1 just so that yeah so there was so so yeah so you can see that the collision was there uh so there's no so there is some collision that happens between these two and i want to make sure that they are below a specific threshold only when the collisions are like high i want to make sure that they uh do it so so when so when the when the gravity value is low it does seem true to the physics uh, of it but when the gravity value is high uh so they just seem to essentially go in a different uh tangent uh, altogether all right i'm going to do so instead of doing this i'm going to remove this and i'm going to check for collisions entirely separately so this would just be responsible for updating and then rendering it let me just copy this whole thing before i cuz i i have done this like a very long time ago um So what I'm doing here is that the update happens in a separate loop and then the collision detection um happens in a separate loop. Uh so because I keep these two separate uh you know just want to make sure that it doesn't sort of affect Oh wow, okay. I think that that seemed to work. So I'm just going to remove the console.log uh here. and uh, and models i'm going to set the g back to 3 let's see yeah i think that's about it i think that's it i think that's true to the physics uh, over there so all i needed to do was to separate out the collisions between uh, the collision detection and the update and render onto different uh, onto different loops that's about it actually yeah so once i did that it did become true to the physics uh, of it so if i was if two bombs on this end moved so two bombs have to move on that and that's how conservation of angular or conservation of momentum essentially works all right let's see if i do uh, what happens if we add a third one so if i moved three pendulums three should be released from the other end as well so there you go so that's how that's supposed to work all right and if i was to move four of them four on the other end should move oh yeah so there you go so that's so that's how it works so yes yeah, so that was basically newton's cradle and uh, you know uh we can have as many cradles as we want so let's say i'm just going to say just have two um have let's say seven pendulums and uh, reduce their mass um let's say eight so that they are smaller in radius so that we can see a lot of them so there you go so that's seven pendulums all hanging by yeah all hanging by their pivot lengths and their angular momentum and all still working <laughs> Yeah. So that's Newton's cradle for you. There are of course a lot of improvements that you can make 
uh, on it. One improvement that I can immediately think of is remember all of these Newton's cradles, I mean all of the bobs of the pendulums, they all have the same mass. So M1 minus M2 and M2 minus M1 would basically result in zero. So this velocity would essentially be zero. So all I need to do is just take this divided by M1 by M2 is that just going to briefly replace this. Um, now because I know that their masses are actually zero, I know that this entire thing would result in a zero. So I'm just going to remove that from the from the equation entirely and see how it um, see how it goes. All right. Uh, so yes, so so there you go. So yeah, so that didn't change anything. And the reason why it cha didn't change anything is because we know that the masses of these pendulums are are exactly the same, which is why it didn't change anything. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm just going to leave a comment. Can leave out the first part of the equation. Yes. So once we do that, still works exactly the same. So yes, so that's Newton's cradle for you. Um, you know, I hope today's episode was useful for you. Um, you know, uh, yeah, was useful for you and in at least understanding how angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum velocities and conservation of kinetic energy and everything works. Uh, so yes, so, so that was Newton's cradle. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, see you all next week.